On today's World Insight, China's global commitments for common good unveiled at the UN General Assembly in the words of Chinese President Xi Jinping. What does China's global development initiative mean for a world in turbulence and transformation? And the delivery of crucial aid to millions of struggling Afghans, a hot button at the United Nations. For a clearer picture of the humanitarian situation, we'll hear from the International Red Cross president. Afghanistan is a very, in a very specific situation because it doesn't have a broadly recognized government and international institutions coming to help uh, the country. Hello, I'm Tian Wei, and this is World Insight coming to you live from Beijing. We begin today's program at the United Nations, where the 76th General Assembly session opened with a mix of in-person and virtual speeches. Several world leaders, including Chinese President Xi Jinping, addressed the assembly. President Xi from China called for bolster confidence and working together in dealing with global threats and challenges to build a better world for all. He presented six commitments under the Global Development Initiative, which includes prioritizing development, taking a people-centered approach, benefits for all, innovation-driven development, harmony between man and nature, and results-oriented actions. President Xi Jinping from China called on countries to bend together toward balanced and inclusive growth. Profound changes are taking place in human society. The world has entered a period of new turbulence and transformation. It falls on each and every responsible statesman to answer the questions of our times and make a historical choice with confidence, courage, and a sense of mission. Not only the Chinese leaders, the UN Secretary General and many other world leaders did deliver their speeches as well at the UNGA opening. Joe Biden, the President of the United States, made his first address as U.S. President to the Assembly. He made repeated references to the importance of multilateralism, stressing the need for nations to work together for a shared future. He referenced the disagreements between China and the U.S. while insisting he doesn't want conflict. He made his case before the UN gathering following big blows to the U.S. image, many believe, on international cooperation, including the chaotic withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan. He made no specific response to the criticism, though, this time. The ongoing UNGA 2021 is expected to discuss the fight against COVID-19, inequality, justice, and climate change. So, could global leaders reach a consensus on these critical issues? Let's ask our panelists. Now, for more on the United Nations General Assembly that is going on in New York, in the Islamabad, Mosharraf Zaidi, senior fellow of Tabad Lab, that's an Islamabad-based think tank. In Boston, Jim Walsh, senior research associate at MIT's Security Studies Program. In Brussels, Nicholas White, senior director and head of services to government at APCO's Brussels office. Last but not least, in Shanghai, Shen Ding Li, professor from the Institute of International Studies with Fudan University. Gentlemen, what a pleasure to see all of you on this very important day. Usually, when the UN General Assembly opens, crucial debates happen. Every leader representing their country want to make a mark there. Certainly, we see many try to do the same thing this year. Now, uh, how should we see the Secretary General's call at the very beginning of the session, saying we better work together to restore, restore hope and confidence, trust? Uh, Mr. White. I think th this needs to be seen very, very clearly in the context of the crisis around climate change. You know, we're at the stage where 
It's going to be very difficult to save the world from a warming of more than two and a half degrees above the uh, above the baseline. Um, the UN General Assembly is not where this is going to be decided. That will be in Edinburgh in a few weeks' time. Mm. But it is the moment when people are going to make their commitments. And we've seen very significant commitments made in the last couple of days, both by China, as you mentioned, and also by the United States. Um, and I think the European Union, uh, sitting here in Brussels, is also very much committed to going down that way. Mm. Will it be enough? We do not know. Certainly some of the small island states that are most concerned, most likely to be affected, feel that it isn't enough and they have been complaining. So we will see. But I, I think this more than anything is what the Secretary General is, is referring to. Mm. On climate change issue, of course, uh, different countries paying their pledges this time at the UN General Assembly, China no exception. After pledging to peak carbon dioxide emissions by the year 2030 and achieve a carbon neutrality by 2060 as the largest developing country, China has taken another big step on climate change. Chinese President Xi Jinping announced at the UN General Assembly that China will step up support for green and low carbon energy in other developing countries and also will no longer build new coal-fired power projects beyond China's border. So that is a very clear commitment uh, uh, from China. You really, earlier, Professor Shen, there were concerns about that, but now that's already very clear. China will not build more new coal-fired power projects abroad. Professor Shen. Uh, this is an issue that uh, Mr. John Kerry uh, talked to China in Tianjin. And the response from uh, Foreign Minister State Councilor Wang Yi was ambiguous. Wang Yi stated that uh, when the U.S. is beating China on almost every issue, uh, it's uh, unrealistic that the U.S. would expect China to return in some area for bilateral cooperation. Mm. Uh, at that time, I thought that Wang Yi is wrong. And today, President Xi Jinping made it clear that we would work with the U.S. with the formula that the U.S. proposed, cooperation wherever possible, even though China and U.S. have difficulty in Hong Kong, in uh, Xinjiang, South China Sea, Taiwan, human rights, but China and U.S. would cooperate and China respond to the world, not only to the U.S., that we would not build any okay. more uh, coal-burning power uh, uh, plants outside of China. This is a direct response to the U.S. in a very positive term, and we, are, we will be waiting for the U.S. for any possible positive response to the U.S. Uh, to the Thank Chinese you. side. Well, since Mr. Walsh, uh, you are the only American sitting in the panel, I have to go to you about an answer about that. Uh, Mr. Walsh, I know it doesn't <laughs> represent the Biden administration, but go ahead, uh, speak your mind. Well, I agree with my colleagues that the climate piece of this is very important, but I'd like to step back a little bit for both Xi's and Biden's speech. There's been a lot of talk around the world about rising tensions between China and the but, but, U.S. But, but, let, let, me, let me just, uh, let, me just uh, let, let me just uh, let you to comment on this yeah. point first, because it seems that a lot of people agree this is about climate change. Uh, uh, the Secretary General has been calling on world leaders. So let me just talk about that point a bit with you before we move on to the other general yeah. aspect. So, Mr. Walsh. Sure. Yes. And, and so I think under a Biden administration, and, and our, our, my colleague mentioned uh, Senator Kerry, that this is a positive development. Both, I would say at the UN, if you look at what China and the US did in their speeches, this was all very positive. No one really took a swing at one another, and they've all made pledges to push on climate. And so I think that that's a serious, constructive approach on both parties' part. But I would pull back just for 10 seconds and say, <laughs> that climate is one example mm. of where there has to be cooperation between China and the U.S., or between China, Russia, and the U.S., between big, important countries mm. and, and collections of countries like Europe. Now, we could have had a situation where they came to the U.N. and started throwing punches, verbal punches, at one another. That did not happen. Instead, they are emphasizing, yes, we have differences, but we can only solve big global problems, whether it's climate, proliferation, what have you, right. if the parties hold on to a relationship that allows them to cooperate, that's very positive development. Mm. Words, at least. 
are coordinating, apparently, with one another. Exactly. Even though they have different phrases to describe it, and the priority might be different, and the ways to get there could be different, but still, there are some common ground. But uh, Mr. Zaidi, is that also your take? Uh, you know, I, I, I hate to go against the grain uh, way, but, you know, the experience of Pakistan <laughs> as, uh, you know, one country, but, but not an insignificant one, in any of the uh, in any of the key issues, particularly climate, uh, Pakistan is one of the top five climate affected nations on the planet. Uh, I think that the insistence of, for example, President Xi Jinping on using multi problems is almost the opposite of what I think a lot of the behavioral instincts of the Biden administration so far seem to be whether it's its behavior with strong allies in NATO like France or it's with uh, frenemies like Pakistan, uh, non-NATO allies but also uh, easy scapegoats for, for things or it's with strategic competitors like China. I don't think that climate will be able to be isolated as an island of cooperation mm. when the principal instinct of the Biden administration is to frame every single issue on the through the prism of its strategic competition with China. So I'm glad that there hasn't been a, uh, any kind of you know, verbal fisticuffs uh, at the UN so far, and it seems like there's cooperation on climate, okay. but I would not bank on that being, being consistently the case, because eventually, if the, le if the principal lens is strategic competition, then even on climate, the U.S. will find some way to beat China over the head, and I'm sure China will find some way to rhetorically uh, push back when when it feels that it's that's that's taking place. So, so, so I really wonder, uh, gentlemen, when you are giving the answers, uh, it seems that we have a whole horizon of uh, different answers from quite pessimistic to the best, uh, cautiously optimistic, uh, if I could use that word uh, for now. But let me move on to other issues because it's not just climate change; it's also uh, issues like hotspot uh, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, now, things are a little bit complicated uh, with the U.S. situation, and the world has been very concerned about the way U.S. left Afghanistan after 20 years occupation. And now the interim government of the Taliban uh, tried to work with the international community, but still a lot of uncertainty. Uh, now, Mr. Walsh, what do you think will be the best word to use legacy, the worst words to use lessons uh, for the United States after that 20 years. How is that issue likely to be touched upon in the future days of the UN General Assembly? You know, I don't think the US is going to put a big focus on Afghanistan. I mean, it, it is human and governmental tendency, once you are done with something, not to go back to it. Uh, to leave it and move on elsewhere. And you'll see in the U.S. press, there's coverage of Afghanistan, but it's declining each day. Now, the U.S. has an important role to play. It has all this money in U.S. banks that's frozen. It's a world leader. It's part of the negotiation. It, it, there, as reported today, U.S. military leaders talk with, Pakistan, uh, with uh, Taliban political leaders every day to coordinate all the little things that have okay. to be done to sort of bring this transition process to a close. But... But, you know, I don't think the U.S. is going to make this a big focus. And I think if you look at the, the real, and it's a problem way, you okay. and I talked about this, and it's not going to be resolved satisfactorily. The Taliban wants recognition, and it wants its money back. And the international community, not the U.S., but including the U.S., the international community, including Imran Khan, who spoke to this recently, want, Pakistan, want the Taliban to do things first before being recognized. I think we have a bit of a standoff. No side is going to be happy. Eventually, some of that money is going to be released to okay. Afghanistan. It has to because of the humanitarian crisis. But people are going to be reluctant to give the Taliban a whole boatload of money and, then ha and fear that the Pal Taliban will take that money and then do what they want. All right. So we're so in for a period of negotiation in which no parties are, ha are happy. Well, there are international crisis uh, reverse groups uh, and also humanitarian groups that are calling on um, international institutions in which the U.S. has a big say um, to unfreeze uh, the assets of uh, Afghanistan because there's a humanitarian crisis going on right now. Too late 
will even mean bigger crisis. Having said that, though, I have to call upon uh, the Pakistan voice. Uh, are we still having you, Mr. Zaidi, uh, about the latest development? Uh, we understand special envoys from China, Pakistan, Russia just met with uh, uh, various officials with the Taliban interim quote unquote government. And they have been discussing about humanitarian aid, about bringing more different factions of Afghanistan into the uh, quote unquote interim government and the future governance. Uh, how do you see Mr. Zaidi in this sense, uh, the international community could play. And from now on, when the US, as Mr. Jim, Wa Jim Walsh just uh, said, just clean the hands and say, we're out of this. What are going to be the roles of the other and the UN's role at the General Assembly? Well, I think this is, uh, this is really one of the most foundational moments uh, that is bringing to fore clarity about the increasing uh, corrosion of the multilateralism and the capacity of countries to work together at the UN. I think what's at stake right now, and has been for many years, I think ever since September 11th, uh, there's been a constant corrosion. But I think in the last few years, as uh, populist movements in the West have taken over mm. and prompted behaviors by Western governments uh, like the United Kingdom uh, and particularly like the U.S. to behave in a more isolationist and self-interested way, that has come because these countries were so vital at the United Nations with the P5 uh, structure at the UNSC. I think what's happened is it's really uh, shaken up the, capa the capacity and capability of multilateralism as, a, as, a, as an okay. idea. So the fact that you see the neighboring countries of, uh, of Afghanistan trying to resolve this, you see China, Russia, and Pakistan sending their special envoys. Actually, at a time when the U UNGA is being, uh, has been convened and is meeting, uh, why, d why does it require Pakistan, Russia, and China to send their special envoys? And I think the answer is that the multilateralism that President Xi is asking for and, and appealing for is actually, it has already collapsed. And so I think one of the questions that the UN and especially the US and the other Western powers need to examine is how much longer they think that the UN can sustain as a credible uh, set okay. of institutions in the face of these behaviors which are more unilateral and interest related. All right, uh, we, we only have one minute and a half to go. It's not fair for the other two speakers, but I have to ask uh, in a very concise way that uh, we heard about multilateralism a lot in the speeches of many, but we also heard uh, so-called partnerships and allies with a huge emphasis on that rather than multilateralism. How shall we see the differences in words and also the differences certainly already in deeds? Mr. White, if you have 40 seconds, what would you say? I, I think we should be careful that we're not using different words to refer to the same thing. I think with multilateralism, I agree that there's been a lack of coordination, there's been a lack of ambition. I think also a lack of strategy. If I go back to Afghanistan, we want to have a situation where there is a recognized government of Afghanistan that everybody can deal with. Okay. We need to think about how we get there and who, and who we do it with. Mm. Mr. Shun, sorry, you have the only 30 seconds to 35. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> Well, we can take uh, all possible means, uh, China, uh, Afghan bilateralism, China, U.S. bilateral uh, uh, consultation system, uh, neighboring country, small multilateralism, and uh, uh, maybe a UN-based uh, true multilateralism. We cannot exclude any uh, lateralism. Well, those are great points. I want to thank the four of you gentlemen for joining us on this very special day. The beginning of the UN General Assembly and all those speeches given by the political leaders, will they be the one that would answer the questions of century? And with confidence and resolve, we'll see the rest of the week. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. You're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. Coming up in our live program, the delivery of crucial aid to millions of struggling Afghans, a hot button at the United Nations for a clearer picture of the humanitarian situation. We'll hear from the International Red Cross president coming up next.
Welcome back. This is World Insight with me, Tian Wei. We continue our show with the UN General Assembly. World leaders are gathering against the current backdrop of disastrous climate change, polarized the world powers, as well as devastating pandemic, all worsened with a global divide among the rich and the poor. Alarms sounded over vaccine shortages and how the pandemic has threatened economic recovery and worsened inequality. Chinese President Xi Jinping pledged to offer more vaccines to nations in need for the rest of the year. Our pressing priority is to ensure the fair and equitable distribution of vaccines globally. China will strive to provide a total of 2 billion doses of vaccines to the world by the end of this year. In addition to donating $100 million to COVAX, China will donate 100 million doses of vaccines to other developing countries in the course of this year. For the rest of the year, the actions for vaccines has to be as soon as possible. Earlier, I talked to Peter Maurer, the president of the International Committee of the Red Cross. As an observer at this year's UNGA, he shared his insights on China's vaccine contribution to the world and also other issues of humanitarian crisis in the world. Let's listen in. As you may know, the UN General Assembly is... Uh, in meeting right now. Uh, tell me more about you as uh, an observer attending the meeting and also your discussions in bilateral meetings with uh, countries all over the world. What are some of the latest information you can bring to us and messages? War, conflict, violence in so many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the combination of all these problems uh, is of course of, uh, uh, an issue of particular attention to us. I think the general impression that the world is at a tipping point, that the convergence of poverty, conflict, COVID, and climate change create an increasing number of people dependent on international humanitarian assistance or an on assistance in general. And of course, unsurprisingly, leaders have different opinions on how to reverse uh, this. Mr. Maurer, as you may know, the Chinese president also delivered uh, his uh, part of the messages uh, to the General Assembly of the UN. He's talking about that statesmen of today needs to answer uh, some of the very crucial questions regarding the transition and regarding the challenges, like some of those that you mentioned earlier. How do you see the role of statesmen and whether that centennial question or centennial questions will be answered with confidence and the right resolve? What the Chinese leader said is a, is a broad reflection so that many in the international community are looking for leadership, for orientation, yeah. for a perspective for the future and for the question how do we get out of the present challenges uh, which affect so many million and hundreds of millions of people and marginalize and disenfranchise those people? Right. Mr. Maurer, I know you and your team are dealing with the issue of crisis and the pandemic combined at the, around the world. Now, on the issue of pandemic, how do you see the contribution of China in dealing with it through vaccines and contributions to developing countries in which your teams around the world are also working in? I certainly appreciate a lot uh, all leaders, including, of course, uh, the Chinese leader making generous offers with regard to the availability, production of vaccines and uh, making these vaccines available to those countries who cannot afford them at the present moment. This is an important step and I think we have heard uh, quite a number of leaders around the world recognizing that we are not sufficiently uh, at scale with the production of vaccines and making these vaccines available to countries. If I look at the problems and from where we look at uh, these challenges, in particular working with communities, working at the bottom of the pyramid, 
uh, we of course encountered a lot of difficulties in implementing the application of vaccines in particular in fragile context. I mentioned just a few. Sometimes there is resistance to vaccines and prejudice against vaccines. So my point is not to diminish the generosity of leaders' uh, promises to work on the delivery of vaccine. I just wanted to highlight that from the production of vaccine, the availability of vaccine right. to the chain till vaccine is applied in the last quarter of the world and in the most remote and marginalized community, a lot of efforts have to be made and that's where ICRC, Red Cross and the Crescent Movement is definitely working hard in order as I often say, to deliver vaccine on the last mile, where it is really difficult and where we need to be able to have an impact. Mr. Maurer, as you may know, and you also mentioned earlier in some of the most unprivileged uh, communities and the societies, uh, there is a, a tremendous problem of inequality in the availability of vaccines, particularly to the developing countries and the least developed economies. Uh, how much is that a big challenge to your team when they are trying to do the humanitarian work on the ground? Well, it is, of course, a huge problem because, as we know, that inequity and inequality uh, are at the origin of so many conflicts and so uh, much tension in society. And therefore, it is of critical importance to make vaccines available so that we diminish the gap between those who have easy access to vaccines and those who are much more challenged to have these accesses. So we do encounter not only reluctance to the vaccine as such, but we also encounter these tensions in society around the availability of vaccines. And very frankly, again, it's not only vaccines, it's availability medical services, availability of health system, but access to health system, which deliver basic uh, health uh, services to people. And so let's not fool ourselves, but the lack of access to health and broader to social systems is very often uh, at the origin of so many tensions in society. And if we look at the drivers of conflict, at the drivers of violence, then very often we can set the origins where we have inequities, inequalities, and tensions in society because of lack of services to people. Peter Maurer, president of ICRC. Over three and a half million Afghans now are internal refugees and their ranks are growing. The United Nations warned recently thousands of people are scrambling to flee Afghanistan even right now after Taliban seized control of the country almost two decades after they were ousted by a U.S.-led coalition and 20 years after U.S. occupation. Food and jobs are scarcer for many Afghans, forcing millions to seek refuge within and outside the nation's borders. More than a billion dollars in aid were pledged at the recent UN donor conference in Geneva. President Peter Maurer of the International Committee of the Red Cross just back from Afghanistan from his field trip. He shared with me his latest work on the ground. I want to move on, Mr. Maurer, uh, to the issue of Afghanistan. Many of the things that you just mentioned, the problems and the challenges that this country specifically is facing right now. The UN General Assembly this year is also putting a focus on the country of Afghanistan. Uh, Mr. President, you just visited Afghanistan, and you also understand that there has been some contributions made by countries at the UN uh, aid conference for Afghanistan. What do you make of the humanitarian efforts globally so far for that country? Afghanistan is a very, in a very specific situation because it doesn't have a broadly recognized government and international institutions coming to help uh, the country and therefore there has uh, emerged a kind of consensus around the delivery of humanitarian assistance. I believe 
this is of critical importance in order to, as you rightly said, uh, to service the Afghan people with the basic medical and other social services right. they need. At the same time, I see there is a lot of controversy on how to move from there. Mm. What is the best way forward? How to work with new authorities? How to work with the Afghan civil societies? What are conditions under which the international community feels comfortable working in Afghanistan? What are the security conditions, the inclusiveness conditions uh, in the country? And I think this is a preoccupation that many actors have and have expressed either at the margin of the General Assembly this year or in bilateral conference. What about the money that has been pledged to donate? How much do we know about the money being implemented? The implementation is still a challenge because, of course, uh, a lot of organization, a lot of people have left Afghanistan in the last couple of weeks. And therefore, projects which were undertaken before have come to a stop. The money pledged and the activities deployed at the present moment are still very modest. Uh, the International Committee of Red Cross has stayed in Afghanistan. Our workers are still all there. They have resumed work. They work with the Afghan Red Crescent Society in close cooperation. But uh, a lot of actors have left, and therefore there is an ob objective gap now, uh, which is difficult to assess. I don't think that at the present moment, money is the main problem. Mm -hmm. The main problem is that there is discomfort with the general situation in Afghanistan. And uh, I think it needs still a political push and also a push from economic institutions to see how they can cope with this new crisis situation where economic uh, insecurity, political insecurity are about to create a major humanitarian concern for uh, almost 40 million Afghans today. You personally called on international organizations such as the World Bank to f unfreeze the fund that belongs to the earlier Republic of Afghanistan to the people now in Afghanistan. How successful this has been and what are the other things that do you think will be crucial to the funding of ICRC in terms of helping and supporting Afghanistan? World Bank will take its decision as other international organizations will take their decision. As we know right now, this is a crisis that is in emergency. So if things are not being acted upon uh, punctually and in time, things will get much worse than what it is now. This is very much our assessment. It's obvious is that when you travel through the country, when you look at problems, the problems are huge and demand. A fast response can come from different quarters. It can come from multilateral institutions. It can, can come from bilateral donors. But I think responding to the humanitarian need, in particular health, water, sanitation, responding to the lack of finances to pay salaries to public officials and to hospital workers, hospitals and local administrations, is a challenge with which the international community has to cope. And therefore, we are still at the very beginning of assessing what the real financial needs are and how to respond in the days and weeks to come to this uh, emerging crisis situation, which I see at the horizon. What about for ICRC? What is your plan? You may have seen that as many other humanitarian organizations, we have considerably increased our budget line. We have spent in Afghanistan something like 85, 87 million US Swiss francs in the last couple of years. We have increased to a budget line of 150 million. We see a keen interest of donors to support our activities also because we do have people on the ground with an, an ability to deliver and we have strong partners in the Afghan Red Crescent Society, which is represented in all provinces, in all the parts, in all the cities of the country. And therefore, uh, I'm very confident that if donors respond 
to demand that we are able to deliver fast, at least at the level of humanitarian assistance, right. we will then still have other problems to deal with at the later stage. Uh, Mr. Maurer, what about your team? How is it uh, trying to deal with the current political and uncertainty in Afghanistan? As we know, the Taliban has put forward a so-called interim government, even though some of the international community members are not satisfied with the result because all of them are Taliban without other participation of political factions inside Afghanistan. So, Mr. President, so this brings another layer of uncertainty of what to happen and how international community will react to what's going on in Afghanistan. What does that mean for ICRC? What is your assessment about this? We will need to engage at local level, at regional level, at national level to create conditions which allow us to have a big impact on the present situation. This needs a committed staff, it needs security also from the local, regional and national authorities in Afghanistan and some of them, uh, I think myself and other humanitarians who have visited over the last couple of days have received assurances. It will be important to translate these assurances into concrete action mm -hmm. so that our colleagues in the field, at the front lines, the our recent colleagues feel safe and feel at ease. The Taliban interim government, quote unquote, have already uh, in written form uh, submitted to the United Nations about trying to guarantee the security of personnel and also the supplies for humanitarian aid. Now, to ICRC, uh, is that uh, also being pledged by the Taliban interim government to your organization? How would you be able to guarantee the security of your team on the ground there? I think Afghanistan, as everybody knows, has a complex reality, has different situations in different parts of the country, sees a very fragmented political landscape, and therefore it is important to be sure that some of these assurances materialize also in a neutral and impartial humanitarian space that we, in which we can operate in different parts of the country. So we, it is logic that in a transformation and transformative phase as we are at the present moment, certain things are not clear, that there is insecurity, and therefore it is important to be there, to engage, to see how, on a day-to-day -day basis, we can negotiate those humanitarian spaces, therefore, and through that, contribute to stabilize the situation, to give assurances by acts and not by words. Uh, that is true for our side as it is for uh, Afghan institutions. Mr. President, you were there in Afghanistan uh, before the UN meeting, General Assembly meeting. What did you see how were your team, together with you, negotiate on the daily basis, as you said earlier, that day when you were there? Uh, what were some of the impressions you have as a very seasoned humanitarian worker yourself? Uh, how do you see uh, your team's best way forward, Mr. President? First, I have to highlight that in all the projects I visited in Kandahar, in Lashkargar, in Hanzi, in all the places where I visited uh, humanitarian projects, many of the people who have been our interlocutors in the past are still our interlocutors at the present moment, uh, even if the government has changed from the previous government to the Taliban government. Of course, uh, we are now in a situation where new relations have to be built and political assurances been established with the relative, with respective authorities in the different cities and provinces of the country. We are ready to do this as we have done in many other places of the world, but this is definitely a focus of our activities at the present moment. We see new people coming in and we seek uh, to build relations, to contact them. Another issue very important about Afghanistan is not only the crisis we're facing, but also how different social groups within that country are being treated, whether they have equal and fair access to the same help 
including the help given by ICRC. Mr. President, uh, particularly this, these groups, uh, people would be very much concerned about women, uh, you know, women's access to health, women's access to education, women's access to food. Uh, what do you make of the general realities now? Uh, on the one side, services are delivered to need, and on the other side, we, our teams, our workers can work in an environment of diversity and, and of inclusion. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to have a credibility as an organization towards a society in which you operate, you have to reflect the multiplicity and diversity of the society in which you work. And therefore, I made it very clear also to our interlocutors in uh, the Taliban interlocutors in Kabul that it is of critical importance that our teams and the teams of the Afghan Red Crescent are diversified teams that men and women, Pashtun and Tajik and other ethnic orientations, uh, attributions that Sunni and Shia and people who have been have their origin in different regions of Afghanistan, that they all have their say and their stake, that they are stakeholders of uh, a good humanitarian work that we develop it. And I think uh, this is, has been a challenge for quite some time in Afghanistan. It has been a challenge in the past, and it is a big challenge today. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, search World Insights or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.